Welcome, folks, to another episode of Our City Matters. Today we have a special guest in honor of Independence Day, which is this weekend. Saturday is July 4th. And we have Diane Gilbert here today with us, and she is the chairman of the National Heritage Center for Constitutional Studies. I think it's just so appropriate that she was able to make it today and, uh, you know, let us know about this topic of independence mm -hmm. and constitution. So welcome, Diane. Thank to the you. Show. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. And so you're from Epping, New Hampshire. I am. And did you begin this, this organization or by yourself or is it a group of Actually, people? Um, co-founded it back in 1997 with um, another uh, gal from Merrimack. And um, she has since moved on and I've just kept the organization going. We started out as the New Hampshire Center for Constitutional Studies, but in looking what we teach, we we said our focus is really mainly our national heritage, not so much New Hampshire's uh, standalone heritage. So we changed our name to the National Heritage Center for That's Constitutional great. Studies. Great. So I, I went to your website and I was like overwhelmed. There's so much information there uh, about you know some courses that you offer mm -hmm. and uh, on the Constitution. And but I, I guess today you want to start off kind of associating the two documents, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence? They are sister documents, they're partners, and the way we like to explain it is that they have um, a reciprocal agreement between them, one supports the other, but our D Declaration of Independence was the um, replacement for the English Charter, which founded the colonies under mm -hmm. King George, um, King George uh, took that charter away in 1775, c declaring us to be too rebellious and not a part of his realm any longer. So the declaration um, replaced uh, the English charter. And now we've got a mission statement, but we have no way to implement it. And so the Confederation Congress, the Continental Congress, I'm sorry, um, wrote the uh, Articles of Confederation and then replace that with the Constitution to implement the Charter. That was a tall order. <laughs> Some very yep. wise and brilliant men. Absolutely. We'll never see their genius again. We will never see their genius again. These men were pro-liberty. They had a political philosophy which says, if you want liberty, you need to give liberty. And that was their um, intention. They were so pure of motive, so pure of motive. Wow. Um, I mean, I'll let you just um, explain or go through, you know, your, your outline here and just let the people know how important this is to maintain. Okay. Well, the, um, the Declaration of Independence actually began as a, it was, isn't really a beginning, it was really a culmination of a number of documents that began way back in the 17th century, and we're talking about our beginnings being the um, Mayflower Compact, which established the first um, civil body politic on this side of the Atlantic. Um, and so over the uh, course of, say, a hundred years, there were a number of freedom documents that were developed, some by individuals, uh, uh, freedom-loving patriots, and then others by the Continental Congress. So we like to think of the Declaration of Independence as not our beginning, but the culmination of um, a series of um, uh, documents issued by the Continental Congress, all of which were trying to reconcile with the king, and the king, of course, would have no part of it. So finally, in 1776, the Continental Congress writes America's first organic law. It's really a declaration, and that's the Declaration of Independence. And as I was explaining to you earlier, I said, well, that's great. Now we have a charter. We know what our uh, mission should be. How do we implement it? And so a set of bylaws called the Articles of Confederation 
was developed, and those not working out so well, it got replaced by the uh, Constitution for the United States of America. So they all form this body of uh, law called American Organic Law. And the one law that I haven't mentioned was one that was written twice. It was actually passed twice, once while the Articles of Confederation were in, um, in force, and then again after the Constitution became law and in force, and that was the um, 1787 Ordinance, and that was a document that um, said, here's how we're going to govern the territories. So uh, it was a very important document. I really encourage everybody to read it because if you are subject to the myths that are propagated about our founding fathers, this one clears them all up. It shows just how pure of motive these men were. Is this on your website as well? Is it available? Oh, there? if you Google, um, I'll go to the Avalon site, which is a very trustworthy site. Be careful where you do get your documents off the internet, but the Avalon site um, is very trustworthy, and you just Google the 1787 ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, you'll be able to see what, um, what that law is all about. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then from there, we get to the 13 colonies, is it? I mean, I'm, I'm rusty on my history, so <laughs> look well, at you're me not alone. You're not for alone. facts. But, well, I mean, we have the colonists, we have the colonies, and then somehow those brilliant men brought the colonies together. That's right, and that's, um, again, the, the work of the Continental Congress um, with the um, Declaration of Independence, uh, developed the document which called us for the first time the United States of America, small u. We were United States under the, um, under the uh, the Declaration of Independence, and we remained that federation of states, which was a loosely uh, horizontally coupled, let's say, um, system of um, sovereign governments, all peers, under, under that document. And then again, the Articles of Confederation kind of pulled us together and gave us something of a general government, but ever so weak, ever so weak. Oh, that's the way they wanted it, though. Absolutely, wasn't it? absolutely. They didn't want this federal takeover. <clears throat> they wanted nothing to do with a strong central government, having just fought a seven-year war for their um, independence. They wanted nothing to do with a strong central government. They wanted something that would hold them together in a cohesive whole. But um, each one of them was its uh, remained its own sovereign state, and we do to this day. We do to this day, even under the Constitution, but you'd never know it. No, states' rights is kind of going out the window. And um, with the Supreme Court rulings we just had this week. Uh, Very unfortunate. That was um, a, a terrible step on American um, freedom and democracy. And while some gains were probably made for a cross-section of the population, many more were lost for the rest of the population, and we should be in fear of, w of what that Supreme Court just did. We should be in absolute fear. And, well, I mean, that's probably a whole other show. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll just stick with the Declaration and the right. Constitution today. Right. And, um, but, okay, so we've had, was it 13 colonies at mm -hmm. the time? Right. Well, it was 13 colonies up to the point where the Declaration was written and then they declared themselves to be independent states. So we became the United States of America. Um, the importance of the Declaration of Independence is that it captures the spirit of 1776, which was the revolutionary patriotic um, movement. It um, declared our independence, declared our right to self-government, which was a belief that the colonists always had. They believed that as Englishmen, they had the right to self-govern. Um, again, it gave us our name, small u, United States of America, and it defined legitimate government. If you read the Declaration of Independence, it says that just government, legitimate government, is a government that is um, uh, 
by the consent of the governed. If you step outside that consent, you have just um, blown away your legitimacy. Back to tyranny. Pretty much where we're mm -hmm. headed, or where we are now, <laughs> yeah. actually, as we are now. Mm -hmm. mm. So it, um, it complements the um, American Constitution, and the Constitution complements it. They are sister documents, one and the same. The Constitution, as with the Articles of Confederation, were rooted in the principles, the freedom principles, that the Declaration of Independence declares. And the danger in separating them, we, which we must never, never do, but the danger in separating them is that if you take the Constitution, if you sever the root to the Declaration, you can make that Constitution say anything you want. And if you go th through recent uh, court history, you'll see that there are very few court cases now that reference the Declaration of Independence. Is it any wonder uh, the Supreme Court can now find meaning in the text that was never there? Right, because I, I remember <coughs> uh, when Ms. Kagan was being um, confirmed and she was asked the question, where does she feel that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness you know, uh, where, where do they stand, where do they lie in, yeah. in, in justice? And she said, nowhere, basically. So it and doesn't. They, and they it's went not on considered. to approve her. Yeah, and they went on to approve her. Mm -hmm. I mean, we should have been shaking in our boots at that point. We should have been shaking in our boots. And really, you know, it makes me ill to watch these um, hearings that are used to uh, confirm uh, a, a judgeship, because the only question that needs to be asked to the uh, candidate is, do you know, love, and approve the Constitution? Test them on their knowledge of the Constitution. Test them on um, where they believe the Constitution to be rooted. And if they can't answer those historical questions, they have no business on, uh, on the bench. No business on the bench. Um, uh, what a lot of people don't understand um, about the Declaration as well is that um, it actually shocked the world. Because if you think about what was going on back in the 18th century when it was written, everything um, tended to be um, top-down government where um, some head, like a king or uh, an emperor, had all the rights. And they would parcel out what rights the people could have and take those rights back whenever they, whenever the spirit moved them to do that. What the Declaration did was to establish a bottom-up government, and that's how our government was framed from a bottom-up perspective, where all the power resided in the masses and then dispersed among the, among the masses so that it could never garner in any one corner or section. And then we, the people, holding all the power in writing the Constitution and ratifying it said, here's, here's the authority that we will give government and all the rest stays with us. Mm -hmm. So it literally turned what was going on in the world on its head. It was no longer one ahead who decided what would get dispersed to the masses. Now it was the masses deciding what government could have. So it actually shocked the world. That had never been done before. Mm -hmm. And now, the document's under threat. Yes, our whole um, system of government is under threat. Um, and the way back to it is to walk back through the door that we exited, and that door is marked education. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole purpose of this organization, is to put that information back into um, society. Thankfully, we're not alone in doing it. There are a lot of good organizations throughout the nation and colleges now that um, are taking steps to make this uh, information available through courses that are online. So at this point in time, with the internet, there's absolutely no reason for people to be ignorant of, of the roots of the American Republic. No, and that's the thing, the word republic and maintaining our republic. Um, we don't hear about that. No, you don't, and uh, Madison, who was the chief architect of the Constitution said, that knowledge was the only way that we could maintain our personal liberty. Mm -hmm. So we better get back to it. 
um, the genie is out of the bottle. I think the good news is that people are starting to wake up. When we first founded this organization back in 1997, if we tried to talk to people about this sort of thing, they would look at us as uh, with a, like a deer in headlights. And, uh, it, you know, we must have been one of those right-wing extremists. But um, as things go over time, they tend to circle back on themselves, and I think that's where we are now. But it is wake-up time. Mm -hmm. It is wake-up time. I'm We're so pretty far down the path. Mm. Yep. So now we're coming to our holiday or remembrance of our independence, yep. and we must celebrate our liberty or, you know, make it special because what we're doing in doing that, I believe, is educating the younger folks, our young, you know, our, our children in the ways of respecting. Right. The, the liberty you have and, and, and fighting for right. liberty and honoring the liberty and just talking about the liberty right. and uh, celebrating the liberty. It's important, for, um, it's important for these principles to be passed down and propagated down through the generations. At this point in time, the American education system is so bereft of um, teaching um, young Americans uh, their heritage, that um, it's it's got to be done in the home, uh, maybe in the church, maybe pastors will mm -hmm. wake up now and We used start, to sing uh, the patriotic songs. They were hymns in those days. Yes, yes. We would sing them in the churches. Exactly. Are they still singing them? Gee, I can't remember the last time I sung one in church, mm -hmm. <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, we're at, a, we're at a crossroads for certain. Because all of this one world government that we're hearing and the children are being told that they are citizens of the world. Of the world. And I can tell you a few stories about that. I actually participated in a, um, in a, um, in a conference, let's call it a conference, where we were uh, with um, teachers and other people uh, from the public and from gov government space. And we were um, looking at the New Hampshire Civic Standard. I was shocked and appalled at what was in that standard so that our children were learning that uh, the Supreme, Supreme Court decision automatically alters the Constitution. How do they get away with that when we have a whole article uh, um, Article 5 of the Constitution, which directs how you go through the constitutional lawful process of amending the document, how do they get away with putting those things in a civic standard? We made several changes to, um, uh, to those kind of issues as we found them in the standard, and um, although we got those passed through our committee of conference, they were never implemented. They were stopped at the um, State Department. Right. So we're um, we're in a, a very um, difficult and precarious place. And um, do you work with the New Hampshire Department of Education nowadays, <laughs> with Common Core, and I mean the U.S. History Standards? And, and, Is there and, even one anymore? Well, it's it's the AP History. Mm. It's been decimated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, and I don't understand. I mean, I just don't understand why people are not concerned, why parents are not concerned. This is, um, this is their posterity that is going to um, never know the country that they grew up in. I don't know the country that my forebears grew up in. And um, generation, two generations ago don't know the country that our forefathers grew up in. They would be absolutely appalled at our loss of um, freedom, our diminishing personal liberty. They would be absolutely appalled by it, and they'd wonder, what happened to the people? What happened to the people? Um, we, are, we will be destroyed for lack of knowledge. We will be destroyed for lack of knowledge. And I don't want to sound like um, 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 that I'm not positive about this, because again, I believe it can be turned around if people would take the initiative to go learn. It's almost like we need another revolution. I mean, hopefully a bloodless one. <laughs> but, 
but but we need a revolution in education that's for sure in mind yeah. and and action exactly and how we live our lives yes we must live free live like we're free to be free and we and we have to know our rights we have to know that um what we inherited we have a duty to protect it's not just a matter of saying here's my right with rights comes duty the duty to protect those rights they can't defend themselves and um, if you don't know what your rights are how can you defend them mm -hmm. how can, can you can we talk them? about the bill of rights sure and that's in the constitution or is it part of the constitution it came along in uh, december 15th of 1791 when when the bill of rights um uh was uh ratified and it was uh, a culmination of um a series of um uh, uh um rights that were sent in from the various states which madison called and um eliminated redundancy and out of the original uh, 13 or so, or 12 actually, there is an argument about 13, um, that was proposed to the people, 10 were ratified by, um, and became law and part of the Constitution, December 15th of 1791. There's an interesting story though about the 27th Amendment. Let me get my Constitution so I can read it to you. This was, one of the original amendments that was left hanging out there and was finally um, approved in, uh, let me see, 1992. Hmm. And it came about as a project that was taken on by um, a graduate student down in Texas. And he realized that this particular amendment one of the original that was sent out as part of, to be part of the Bill of Rights, but never, uh, never um, ratified. Um, it had to do with varying the compensation for the services of senators and representatives. And so um, it had to do with, if the Congress voted themselves a pay raise, mm. when would that take effect? And Madison thought it was just absolutely um, horrible that the Congress could vote themselves pay raises. And so um, this amendment, which says, again, no law var uh, varying the compensation for the services of the senators and representatives shall take effect until an election of representatives shall have intervened. So they had to go through a whole national election before um, the pay raise could take effect. So Congress today, if they voted themselves a pay raise, would have to wait until the next national election for that pay raise to go into effect. So that was one way that they could, could, could control them. So this young um, graduate student uh, down in Texas realized that that amendment was still out there with no, um, no drop dead date, let's say. Now they'll say, generally, if they put an amendment out there, they'll say, if this isn't ratified within seven years, it dies on the vine. But that didn't happen with Madison's. So he, as part of um, uh, uh, his um, uh, project, his, uh, a project that he took on for the uh, graduation uh, and his master's degree, uh, he, um, had a bet with his professor that he could do this, and he did it. Michigan was the final state to ratify it, right? but he just chased all the states down and got the state legislatures one by one to approve it. So, so, so every four years, or however many years is it that they give themselves a pay raise? Every well, if they have to wait for a national election of the House, so that's every two years. Two we years turn the House out right. every two years. Yeah. Right. Well, um, do you want to go over your website a little bit and and talk about the courses that you're you're offering courses? Mm -hmm. uh, yep, yeah, there's and, a list of them out there. I can give you that. And and so the folks in the community can go to National Heritage Center for Constitutional Studies, which is abbreviated NNCCS. NHCCS. I'm sorry, NHCCS dot yep. org. Yep. And they they can learn some some history here right we we offer um a new course which uh, is um 
Our newest course is our Magnificent Constitution. Okay. It is a 15 to 16 hour course. We generally break it up over uh, n number of sessions, n number of hours. So if somebody wants to sit there, you know, for six hours, we can do it in two and a half sessions. Mm -hmm. If somebody wants to, if the group only wants to do two hours or three hours at a time, then we just stretch it out um, that many more weeks. But um, we have, um, uh, excuse me one moment. We have um, a course on the roots of the American Bill of Rights. A lot of people just don't understand that uh, we were born a Christian country based on Judeo-Christian principle, and that is where a lot of this attack is coming from. They're just pulling that rug right out from underneath our Constitution. Um, we have another course called the Watershed Year, 1913. That was a very important year in American history. Mm -hmm. Um, sort of redirected us down a path we were never to go. Mm -hmm. We also have one on the misconstrued clauses of the Constitution, and this deals with general welfare, the necessary and proper clause, uh, the supremacy and the interstate uh, commerce clauses. Um, and then our newest one is our magnificent Constitution. So do you offer that course in Epping, or, or can someone sponsor the course in their community? We will take them anywhere. We'll do mm -hmm. them on site. Oftentimes, we, we will also do them, excuse me again, online, so we can do um, internet-based courses. Um, most people I'm finding really prefer to be in the company of a live instructor so that they can converse and ask questions and hear what everybody else is saying. Although we can do that on the internet, the mm. the um, the presence, the interaction, the physical presence seems to really make a difference. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and also you want to let folks know about your Constitution dinner? Yeah. Every year since 1997, we have held, um, a, the first year was a breakfast, I stand corrected. The next, every other year after that was um, a dinner. It's um, a, um, a day-long seminar, which opens around uh, noontime and it offers four seminars on various subjects um, and issue, um, issues or um, just aspects of constitutional government and the Constitution. And um, following that, we go into the main portion of the seminar of the conference, which is keynote speakers and um, a plated dinner. Now, this year we have Alan Keyes coming. Oh. And he is just a, a marvelous orator. I mean, he is just, he's spellbinding. He really is. And um, we also have Dr. Edwin Vieira, who is a, um, a constitutional expert, scholar, attorney, uh, graduate of Harvard Law School. And what's the date of that dinner? September 20th. And September 20th in Epping? We're holding it at the Sheraton in... Um, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Okay, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Yeah. We're wrapping up right now. Uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, September 20th, 20th yeah. is the Constitution Dinner. Yeah. And more information, folks, you can reach Diane on, on through the website, and that's National Heritage Center for Constitutional Studies. We appreciate your attention to this episode. Take care. Have a happy Fourth of July. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Absolutely.